Last week, I streamed a movie called Church People. It's a comedy that came out last year, and it has a couple of the uh, Baldwin brothers in it and a Christian comedian whose uh, name I can't quite remember, and, and a few other actors who I, I recognize, but I, I don't know their names. Anyways, I suppose I should give you a spoiler alert, because uh, I don't suppose that too many of you have seen it. How many of you have watched Church People? Okay. Well, you can, it's on several different uh, the streaming platforms, and uh, you can also rent it. Uh, but I'm going to tell you about what happens, and then you can decide whether you want to watch it or not. The movie is about Sand Hills Neighborhood Church, a mega church that's led by Pastor Skip and their youth leader, Guy Sides. The church has exploded in growth, and youth pastor Guy no longer has time for the youth because he's jetting around the country leading seminars and selling his books. He tries to point people to the cross, but it doesn't seem to be enough. It's not enough for some people. People like Pastor Skip, who is desperately trying to find the next big thing that will draw people to church for the Good Friday service. And he decides that that thing is that they do a crucifixion. And I don't mean a mock crucifixion. He decides that they should crucify one of the members of their church. Now, not to death, but just to, to show what Jesus went through. And that's his big idea. And of course, he asked the youth pastor to volunteer. <laughs> you know, so AP and, uh, and Duncan and Elijah, don't worry, we're not going to do any crucifixions here. But, but youth pastor guy turns him down. Says, not only is he not going to do it, he's not going to let the pastor crucify anyone. Okay, give me an alternative, demands Pastor Skip. I don't know, says Guy. Kick it old school. Preach on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Huh, says Pastor Skip. How riveting. We're competing against a lot of noise here, Guy. We've got to grab their attention and hold it. You know, Skip, says Guy, I think the gospel's enough. Well, Guy won't help him, so Pastor Skip convinces a gullible youth to be the one to be crucified. And Guy tries to talk the student out of it. But the young man says, I'd do anything that God wanted me to, even crucifixion. Jesus was enough, don't you think, says Guy? Jesus died in our place so we don't have to. That's the whole point. His death, his burial, his resurrection, period. No, actually, I, I, I won't spoil the movie for you. Uh, you can watch it uh, if you want. But here on this Easter weekend, what's enough for you? What's enough for you? You know, we've spent all of Lent looking at, at what is good enough, and we've seen that God doesn't demand our perfection or overachieving because we can never be perfect. We can never be good enough on our own. That's why we need Jesus. But is Jesus enough? Is the death and resurrection of Jesus enough to change your life today? To make this day the greatest celebration of the whole year? Is the gospel enough? Is Jesus enough? The earliest written accounts of the resurrection in the Bible are, are found actually not in the Gospels, but in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And in it, he describes the Gospel as he shares it. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, 
Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. That's it. That's the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And on Easter, he rose from the dead and was back in the lives of his friends. And I believe that's enough. I believe that's all we need. Forgiveness of sins and and Jesus alive and back in our lives. It was certainly enough for Mary Magdalene. When she learned that Jesus is alive, that's all that mattered. Having Jesus alive again was enough. John writes about this in his gospel, and although he he writes the words down after Paul wrote his letter, he's describing what happened on that very first Easter when Mary came to the tomb there in the garden. Here's what John wrote. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Now, he didn't believe that that Jesus was resurrected. He believed what Mary said, that somebody's taken the body. Because John points out, they still did not understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciple went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he'd said these things to her. That story has always puzzled me. Not that the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty and the angels are, are standing there, or even that Jesus was resurrected. But what's always puzzled me is why Mary thought Jesus was the gardener. I mean, she knew him about as well as anybody else. So why didn't she recognize him that day? Was it that she was crying so hard she couldn't see through the tears? Was was it that she needed glasses and they didn't have them back then? Or maybe Jesus was wearing the gardener's clothes. You know, when, when Jesus was crucified... They gambled for his clothes. And they buried him with just that linen there. And John points out very specifically that the cloth that he was wrapped in was left there. So how did he get his clothes? I don't know. 
Maybe the gardener had left a pair of old work clothes there, and Jesus picked it up. Who knows? It's so confusing. But Mary was even more confused. Was he the gardener? No, Mary, he wasn't the gardener. He was the garden. Or rather, he was the crop, the harvest, the first fruit out of the garden, as Paul calls him in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the way that that verse 20 puts it there. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And fallen asleep means in death. The first fruits of those who have died and been raised to life. It may seem weird to call Jesus a fruit, but then again, there's, there's a lot of things that are technically fruit that we don't think about as fruit. I mean, you've all heard that tomatoes are fruit, right? But so are cucumbers and squash and snap peas and eggplant and string beans. And you can Google why. We don't think about them as fruit, but they are. And we don't think of Jesus as a first fruit. Actually, we don't think about first fruit at all. But in the Old Testament, the Bible instructs the Israelites that they are to offer the first fruits, the first of their harvest to the Lord as a way of thanking God. And in Deuteronomy 18.4, they're told to, to bring the first fruits to the priests. The first fruits of your grain, your wine, and your oil, as well as the first of your fleece of your sheep, you shall give to him. You give the first fruit in thanks, trusting that there will be more fruit to follow. Now, any of you who garden know that, that the first fruit tastes the best. I mean, that first ripe strawberry, which will happen in July or August this year, I think. <laughs> that first ripe strawberry. I mean, there's nothing better. Or that, that first sweet corn of the season. Oh, you know, by, by the time the summer is over, you're, you're kind of done with sweet corn. But man, that first fresh sweet corn, it is so good, the first fruits. And that's what Paul's alluding to when he talks about Jesus as the first fruit. He's that wonderful, special, first taste of an abundant harvest that's to follow. Yes, Mary had Jesus back and alive, and even if she did confuse him with the gardener, at least she had that first fruit. And when he calls her by name, and she realizes that Jesus is with her again, She really couldn't ask for anything more. It was enough. And it's enough for us too. It's enough to know that Jesus was raised, that he died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried in accordance with the scripture, and that he rose victorious on the third day. And if that's all Easter was, it would be enough. But while we may settle for good enough, God doesn't. God never settles for good enough. God goes beyond enough. So Easter is about giving us more than enough. Because not only is Easter the day that Jesus rose from the dead, it's also the day that we are guaranteed resurrection. Let me read a different translation of of that verse 20. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from the dead as the guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. But the truth is, Christ has been raised from death as the guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. Did you know that the Bible's promise is not that we get to go to heaven and live there for all eternity? The Bible's promise is that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and Christ shall come and the dead shall be raised like him in our physical bodies. Paul explains it in in that 15th chapter, the letter we've been looking at. He says, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And when you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. To each kind of seed, he gives its own body. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. 
it is raised imperishable. For this perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses the seed analogy for God's promise that the bodies that we will have are as different from the bodies that we have now as plants are from the seeds from which they come. But the resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee that we shall be raised like Christ. And unlike seeds, every single one of us is guaranteed to rise to new life in Jesus. Those of you who are our gardeners know that when you plant seeds, it's kind of a crapshoot. I mean, birds and squirrels dig them up. There's insects and disease that gets, gets to them. Not every seed rises up to life. In fact, on some of my seed packages, it, it tells you how many seeds to expect to fail. So I've got a, a package of, of beet seeds here, and it says guaranteed germination 70%. Or higher. That, that, that means 30% could stay in the ground dead. That's almost one in three. Radishes are a little better. It says 75% or higher. Some watermelon here says 75% too. And cucumbers are even better, 80%. And snap peas too, but 80% is still one out of five. One out of five is going to stay dead in the ground. The best one I found was mustard. Mustard germinates at a rate of 92%. That's pretty good. Maybe that's why Jesus talks about having a mustard seed faith. But even 92% means that 8 out of 100 will stay dead. Would you bet your life on those kinds of odds? I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet my life on 92% odds. But we don't have to. Because there is an ironclad 100% guarantee that you will rise to life in Christ. And God gave that to us on Easter when Christ rose from the dead. The first fruits of an abundant, tremendous harvest of resurrection. You know, if Jesus just died on the cross for our sins and rose on his own, that'd be enough. But God gives us more. The resurrection of Jesus is a guarantee of our own resurrection through him. So you don't have to be crucified. We don't have to to nail our youth leaders to the cross or some gullible youth. You don't have to be nailed to the cross to pay the price for your forgiveness. Jesus has already paid the price and he told us from the cross, it is finished. It's complete. His death. His burial. It's done. We don't need to have any more crosses because Jesus is is enough. But now resurrection, that's a different story. His resurrection is just the first of many, the first fruit, the guarantee of a great harvest that you and I will be a part of. God turns our graves into gardens. And so I want to encourage you this this spring to go out and plant some seeds, whatever kind you like, flowers, vegetables. And if you don't have a garden, get a pot and put some seeds into it and just watch. And when, when they spring up to life, remember that you will rise in Christ. Jesus is just the first fruit. Easter is just the beginning. There's more to come. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Let's pray. Jesus, on this day, death was defeated. But it wasn't just defeated for you. It was defeated for us, too. 
just as you gave your life for us, so your resurrection is a guarantee to us that we should rise to and be with you. God, thank you. Thank you so much for the promise. Thank you that we don't have to to be nailed to crosses. Thank you that we can live with you through your resurrection and ours. How deep is your love that you would do this for us. It's beyond imagination. But you've done it. Amen. Thank you.